Such was the funeral that took place during this winter with which the first year of the war came to an end. In the first days of summer, the Spartans and their allies, with two-thirds of their forces, as before, invaded Attica under the command of Archidamus, son of Zeuxidamus, king of Sparta, and established themselves and laid waste the country. Not many days after their arrival in Attica, the plague first began to show itself among the Athenians. It was said that it had broken out in many places previously in the neighbourhood of Lemnos and elsewhere, but a pestilence of such extent and mortality was nowhere remembered. Neither were the physicians at first of any service, ignorant as they were of the proper way to treat it, but they died themselves the most thickly, as they visited the sick most often. Nor did any human art succeed any better. Supplications in the temples, divinations and so forth, were found equally futile, till the overwhelming nature of the disaster at last put a stop to them altogether. That was Dr. Paul Monk, reading from Thucydides, Book Two of his classic The Peloponnesian War, and his opening description of the plague in Athens. So Paul, we're all in lockdown today in the midst of fears about a global pandemic on the scale of the Spanish flu of 1918. Why? Well, I think you put your finger on it by referring to the Spanish flu. So the moment it became clear that COVID-19 had broken out of China and was spreading around the world, because it was a new virus and the degree of its uh, infection, uh, you know, its infectiveness and uh, the mortality rates from it were hard to gauge. There was an immediate fear among specialists that this could be the pandemic we've been fearing for many years and that it could replicate the Spanish flu in its impact. And this has been a meme in wide circulation in uh, the last few months for obvious reasons, but it's worth recapitulating that the Spanish flu killed an estimated 50 million people in 1918 to 19 uh, in a world with a population a quarter of what it is now. So the equivalent now would be 200 million people dying. That's unimaginable. I mean, that's four times the number of people who died in the whole world during the Second World War, for example. So mm. the, it would be a true catastrophe. And people feared that something like that could be in the offing unless we were able to react quickly. And, of course, we hadn't reacted altogether quickly for a number of reasons we can discuss. So the, the concern was that it's out, the horse is bolted, and uh, we don't know how dangerous this is. We don't know infection rates and mortality rates. We have to move quickly to find a way to keep this under control or it could be devastating. That's why we're under lockdown, because the consensus was the only way to stop this becoming devastating is to stop people from freely associating and thus spreading the disease. Hmm. So how good a grasp do we have on <clears throat> predictions and mortality rates? I think it has to be said that even now, after specialists, you know, um, uh, virologists and biologists and analysts have been pondering this uh, for the last three months, we still don't have a clear analysis of exactly what the expected infection rate or mortality rate is. And this is due to a number of factors. One is that we don't have good data out of China where it began. The, the Communist Party has been very secretive about it all. Secondly, that it's a new virus, and so we don't have, as it were, population data to build upon. Thirdly, because the mortalities that have occurred so far have been confused somewhat by comorbidity. So certain cohorts of people have been more prone to get the disease and to die from it than others because they were old or already ill and vulnerable for other reasons. And uh, uh, it's been difficult to get this data clear. The, the mortality rates appear to have varied from one country to another. Um, the data collection has been different in different cases. And getting global cooperation, coordination and analysis hasn't come readily. And that's indicated, for example, by the fact that the World Health Organization has played an ambiguous role in this matter, uh, so much so that the US government, rightly or wrongly, has chosen to defund the World Health Organization now on the basis that that, that UN organisation failed us all. Uh, whether it did fail us, and in particular whether defunding it is the appropriate response is something one could debate, but that's what's happened, and that's indicative of where we're at with data. Mm. We're still trying to make it up as we go along. Leaving aside for a moment the matter of broader public reactions, how did you come to terms with the outbreak and the projections? Well, it's worth... Uh, pointed to, I suppose, three factors, maybe four factors that uh, positioned me to think about this relatively clearly. So the first thing is that it originated in China and a lot of controversy concerning it was uh, swirling around because of the 
the way it had been handled by the Chinese Communist Party. And as much as the question of uh, infection rates or, or virology, the role of China in this attracted my attention because, as your listeners may be aware, I was at one time head of the China Desk and Defence Intelligence and I've remained uh, a student of and a commentator on China and the Communist Party and geopolitics ever since. Uh, so that meant that I was drawn to the subject from an analytical angle. Secondly, uh, one of the things I'd long been interested in, which is, was connected both with China and the question of uh, viral disease, was the SARS crisis of 17 years ago. Now, many of your younger listeners won't even have been, as it were, intellectually conscious 17 years ago. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and uh, it's worth recapitulating that at the time, in 2003, under very similar circumstances to what appears to have happened in this case, a new coronavirus broke out of China and there was uh, alarm signals because it was feared this could be a global pandemic. It didn't turn out that way. The total number of mortalities in that case was fewer than a 1,000, most of them in China. Uh, however, the, the way it was handled at the time by the Communist Party was disturbingly similar to the way it's handled this case. That is that it, it was in denial early, it suppressed stories, it tried to tell the Chinese public and the world that there was no problem, it wasn't believed. Uh, eventually the virologists managed to get some action taken and the thing was brought under control. The problem originated in, in wet markets in Guangzhou rather than Wuhan. And the general lesson that was uh, derived from this by specialists was, well, we've got to do this better next time. Mm -hmm. huh? Well, we didn't do it better next time. And, and because I was aware of that SARS case, I immediately started thinking, uh-oh, so this is SARS-2 and it's not going well. Mm. And uh, so that's the second reason why I was well positioned in a sense to make sense of what was going on. The third is that I had been familiar for many years with a great novel about uh, epidemic disease, if not pandemic disease, one which um, a number of your readers may have encountered for the first time in this present context, and that is a novel published in 1947 by uh, the French writer Albert Camus called The Plague. Now, it's a fictional story set in Oran, um, and the disease is confined to one city, but it's a magnificent portrayal of human reactions to the breakout of disease. In a lot of ways, he modelled that story and what happens in the city on his knowledge of Thucydides. We had that brief reading from Thucydides at the outset. Mm. Um, but he also used it as a kind of allegory at two levels. He wrote it during the Second World War when France was occupied by the Nazis. And so it was an allegory in a sense of the occupation of an oppressive and indeed barbarous power um, of another country and, and how human beings respond to that. Secondly, he was an existentialist philosopher and he was using this as a way to explore the way in which human beings more generally respond to the intrinsic uh, precariousness and, uh, as he would have said, absurdity of the human condition. Mm. And it's beautifully written uh, at all three of those levels and it's still powerful. And I had read it many years ago. I'd reread it in recent years. And one of my first instincts when COVID-19 broke out was to pick it up and read it yet again. Um, so all of that pre-positioned me to respond. But the fourth factor, as I said, there's, there's perhaps four and not just three, is that uh, due to having had problems with illness myself in recent years, I had retired from active consulting work and uh I was already a kind of pioneer of self-isolation before we were urged <laughs> to undertake that because yeah. I, I live on my own. I work from a home office. I spend most of my time reading and writing. I go for a solitary walk most days on a constitutional basis. Monkish existence. Uh, monkish existence, you might say, yes. And, uh, and so I didn't have to change my lifestyle terribly much while everybody else was drastically changing theirs. And it gave me an unusual point of view on the requirements of the circumstances. Mm. Hmm. So if we're going to unpack each of those uh, four responses you've outlined uh, in a bit more detail, um, talk to me a bit more about your knowledge of the history of pandemics. Yes, well, uh, again, this was something um, you might say exhibited by the fact that I would have begun with a short reading from Thucydides that was submitted to me from deep background reading long before there was a COVID-19 and indeed in my personal case before there was a SARS that I'd read Thucydides as a young person and have always regarded the Peloponnesian War as one of the master classics in the Western canon. Uh, 
and his description of the plague at Athens is very so- sobering um, because he was interested not only in symptoms and in trying to figure out what was this disease and where did it come from, but in the impact it had on society, on people's morality, the way they behaved, um, their belief systems, etc. It's it's a very searching few pages of his history. What I also knew, of course, which Thucydides, for obvious reasons, didn't, is that there'd been major epidemics or pandemics uh, after that. Um, there was a major one in the late second century in the Roman Empire, generally known as the Antonine Plague, which is estimated to have killed about 5 million people. It's, that's uh, about probably 25 times the size of the population of Athens in Thucydides' time, right? So there's mm. a lot of people. Mm. Uh, and uh, and it sapped the vitality of the empire towards the end of the reign of Marcus Aurelius, generally regarded as the last of the so-called five good emperors in Rome. It, it was a geopolitical event, mm. quite as much as an epidemiological one. Uh, but there was a, a much bigger one with more dramatic consequences several centuries later when Justinian was emperor of a shrunken Roman empire, which was in fairly robust condition, even though it was half the size of the empire at its height. And uh, a plague of monumental proportions hit the empire, and it's estimated that 25 million people died. Now, that's something like half the population of the empires at the end. It's a devastating plague. And had it not also smitten the Persian Empire, the great rival of the Roman Empire, then the Roman Empire might have been in very serious difficulties. But at any rate, it certainly did sap the strength of the Roman Empire uh, at a critical point in its history. And one consequence uh, of it smiting both those empires, combined with the fact that they fought each other to a standstill for about 50 years, um, is that they were so weak by the early 7th century that the Arabs were able to overrun both empires and establish the Islamic Empire, which is a major geopolitical shift in world history. Mm. Uh, and, and all of this was familiar to me, again, as I stressed before, anything like what's just happened took place. People are generally aware of the Black Death, of course, which killed about a third of the population of Europe and many people outside Europe in the 14th century. There was the Great Plague of London in the 17th century. There was the Spanish flu. And, and um, as a student of history, I was familiar with all of these. So, And smallpox in the Americas is one, one you've written about. Well, indeed, that's, that's true. And thanks for reminding me, because that was the mother of all uh, plagues, as it were. And... As some people may be aware, there's a famous book by Jared Diamond called Guns, Germs and Steel uh, about the European conquest of the Americas. And he makes the point that we didn't, I say we in a loose sense, but Europeans didn't arrive in the Americas only with better weapons than the Native Americans had, which they did, and with horses, which the Native Americans didn't have. They arrived also... uh, and much less intentionally, with germs to which many Europeans had immunity and to which there was no immunity at all in the New World. And so plagues swept the Americas well ahead of the conquistadors themselves. In the first instance, smallpox. The smallpox uh, spread from European landing points in the Caribbean and Mexico down into South America and up into North America, well ahead of the conquistadors themselves who had nothing to do with it. They were oblivious to it and they had no germ theory of disease. So they were themselves ignorant of what was going on. And by the time Pizarro, for example, arrived in Peru uh, to conquer the Incas, the Incas had already been swept by disease and were somewhat weakened in mm. consequence. But in the century before, between 1492 and roughly 1600, the population of the Americas is estimated by the specialists to have dropped by 95%. So just compare it with the Black Death. A third of Europe's population dies in the 14th century. 95% of the Native American population is swept away. How many tens of millions is that meant to be? Well, there is considerable debate about exactly how many Native Americans there were in 1492. Uh, And to put it concisely, until about the 1970s, the consensus was probably about 7 million in the two continents combined. As a result of a lot of spade work done in the 1960s and 70s, that consensus shifted radically and it is now agreed, even by people who were sceptical initially, that the native population of the Americas as of 1492 was probably more like 60 million. And so the number of deaths we're talking about extending over a century, allowing for reproduction, is in excess of 60 million people dying. Mm. Mm. Very sobering indeed. Uh, you've also got a an angle in response to the virus, um, giving your work in the Defence Intelligence Organisation on the China Desk and your 
particular interest scholarly and personally as well in China and the Chinese Communist Party. So could you talk more about that? Yes, well, um, the the deeper background to that is that when I joined Defence Intelligence in 1990, I had a degree in European history, hence Thucydides and the Black Death and so forth. And I had a PhD in international relations on the United States and counterinsurgency in the Cold War. And, um, but Defence Intelligence said to me, that's all very well, but we want you to work on East Asia. That means China, Japan, Korea, Taiwan. And uh, I gravitated towards China because it's the biggest player on the block, uh, even then and certainly now. Uh, And I became head of the China desk by 1994. And uh, it was a very, very interesting job even then. It would be far more so now. Um, Since leaving government, I've continued to take an active interest in it. I taught Chinese politics in 1999 at one of our universities. And uh, and I published a book in 2005 called um, Thunder from Silence and Rethinking China. So actively thinking about the way the Communist Party governs China, about the implications of China's economic growth, about its military and strategic ambitions, um, about secrecy and human rights and so forth, positioned me, you might say, very well indeed to to understand what the party was doing in this case, what was going on. And inevitably, of course, it attracted my interest. And the key thing here is that from very early, once it became evident not only that a disease like SARS had broken out again, but that it had, it, had, um, it had got out the door and it was becoming a global problem, not just a Chinese problem, and that the party had arrested and detained people who were trying to tell the truth about this, uh, and it arrested and imprisoned people who were criticising it for arresting those people. Inevitably, one thought two things. First of all, well, this is par for the course of the Chinese Communist Party. This is what it does. It's deeply dishonest, totally self-interested and strategic in the way it behaves. It's not transparent, it's not accountable, and it's not just. And that activated interest in pursuing the matter of secrecy and repression. But secondly, because this is now a, a global problem of disease, one had to take an interest in, so how is it that this happened exactly? And that's where... Um, very quickly and globally, nothing to do with me personally, of course, Mm, mm. a number of conspiracy theories arose. Now, as an analyst, as an intelligence analyst, I was very interested. So where are these conspiracy theories coming from and how much credibility is there in any of them? Mm, Yeah. And you've also got an academic interest in in virology and globalization as well. So... Yes, uh, I wouldn't say an academic interest, but, but because of my interest in the SARS problem, Years before there was COVID-19, I read things about Ebola in Africa and how it was handled. Uh, I read about SARS. uh, And in particular, as a reference point, I read a book published in 2011 by an American virologist, Nathan Wolfe, called The Viral Storm, in which he was saying, in the wake of SARS and Ebola and so on, we really need better global early warning systems for pandemics. Mm. And we need to share information. We need to be open about this. And we need to better understand the public health implications and the economic implications of possible pandemics. Because, uh, and he elaborated on this beautifully in his book, we need to understand that two things are happening in lockstep in our time. One is that our science and our understanding of what viruses are, how diseases spread, how to treat them, is all improving rapidly. And this is good news. But the other is that the vectors that drive the outbreaks of pandemics are all getting worse. Why is this? Well, he says, and he explains this very carefully, in historic time, diseases, pandemic diseases that have killed large numbers of human beings have actually been able to germinate and and spread because of the human invention of agriculture, uh, because of the storage of grain, because of the building of cities and people living in close proximity to one another and the various unsanitary conditions that result from that, because of trade and travel. Mm. All of these things in the 20th and 21st centuries have grown enormously. So huge numbers of people now live in vast cities, vast numbers of people travel all over the world, right? It's very difficult, therefore, to quarantine a bug when it starts to travel because it looks for extra parties and hey there's lots of human beings around in cities and there's lots of them traveling and that he says means that the the danger of a viral pandemic is greater now than ever before but so is our science better than ever before mm-hmm. and it's a it's an arms race between these two things now he's writing this a decade ago and he was 
quietly confident, he said at that point, that we would be able to set up a global early warning system. Well, we now know that we didn't. We failed. Globally, we failed. The, the, the early warning system didn't function adequately. The World Health Organization didn't do its job properly. The Chinese Communist Party didn't work on a cooperative basis. It was secretive and, and mendacious. The US government was all over the map and trying to figure out whether there was a pandemic and how serious and what to do about it. And everybody's basically had to act on an improvised sulky pur that is, you know, every man for himself basis. And that's a mess. And we'll come back doubtless to that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So could you also do a bit of a deep dive on uh, Albert Camus and the Plague, that novel you mentioned before? Yes, well, I, I described it before, uh, I think, and I, I posted this on Facebook very early in the current situation where I said, if you're looking for some reading to help position yourself in these contexts, um, one of the best things you can do is read the Plague. And uh, it's remarkable to reflect that Camus himself wrote this when he was in his early 30s, a very young man, and the maturity of his description of human behaviour and of character uh, and of the nature of the disease is still very impressive. Uh, but why in particular is it relevant now? Because it's it's not a sensationalised story. It's a philosophical, deeply reflective story. And the the main character in it is a, a doctor in Oran called Bernard Rieux. And you realise only at the end that if any character in the novel represents Camus' personal standpoint, philosophically and morally, it's Bernard Rieu. Uh, and Rieu responds to the disease in a stoic way. He's, he's responsible, he's reflective, he doesn't panic. He's a, a doctor and so he sees it as his job to help people and to try and create with the civic authorities a regime which can contain the disease and quarantine people who are seriously ill and treat those that it's possible to treat. And, and prevent people getting out of the city so that they don't spread it to other cities. And all of this is strikingly relevant right now because we have faced the same basic problems. And Rieu's composure and seriousness and um, uh, rationality are admirable. Um, and he's, he's not an enthusiast. He's not self-conceited. Um, he doesn't think he's got all the answers. He's not sure that his measures will work. He's not even very quick off the mark to diagnose the plague uh, when it starts uh, because his mind is elsewhere. He's, he's doing his other things. But the particular reason that I would emphasise the, the beauty of this is because right at the end, and I might read the final paragraph of his novel, what, uh, what Camus has Rieu reflect is that, OK, so we've contained this disease. People died and the city went through a trauma, but the disease has subsided and we're going to recover from this. We will probably in the near future be in that situation ourselves. The question is, what are we? What lesson do we draw from that? And what Rio reflects on, which I'll read, is that people didn't expect this to occur and they'll probably want to go back to the way they were and assume, well, that was just an accident or a misfortune. Mm -hmm. Don't make too much of it. Mm. Live as we would have lived. Yeah. He says, what they're not taking account of is that just as when it started... They didn't initially take it seriously because they thought the plague had disappeared a long time ago. Didn't the plagues don't occur anymore? Well, it did occur. We have been struck by a pandemic, uh, and most people, it seems to me, are probably caught short thinking, where does this come from? Why is this happening at all? So here's the way he concludes the novel. And this is Rieu reflecting, as I said. As he listened to the cries of joy that rose above the town, Rio recalled that this joy was always under threat, he knew that this happy crowd was unaware of something that one can read in books, which is that the plague Bacillus never dies or vanishes entirely, that it can remain dormant for dozens of years in furniture or clothing, that it waits patiently in bedrooms, cellars, trunks, handkerchiefs and old papers, and that perhaps the day will come when, for the instruction or misfortune of mankind, the plague will rouse its rats and send them to die in some well-contented city. <coughs> So metaphorically, that's precisely where we are now, right? And, and in a beautiful kind of way, the very end of that French novel from 1947 gets us to precisely where we started at the beginning of this year and where we're at. Mm -hmm. And what we need to bear in mind as we come out of the immediate crisis is the wisdom of that paragraph. This is not a one-off event. Mm 
This is not a random accident. We live in a century where pandemics are going to be a danger because, as Nathan Wolf pointed out in 2011, all the vectors that drive pandemics have been exacerbated by the very prosperity and globalization that most of us rejoice in. Hmm. And those aren't going away anytime soon. And if they do, the consequences would be catastrophic. Yeah. So we, we don't want to throw those away. And therefore, we're going to have to deal with this danger. Yeah. And despite the universality of pandemics and plagues in this experience, there have been wildly divergent global reactions and experiences of the, uh, the virus itself. Um, thinking about Italy and US and those high death rates and mortality rates there, um, the strange case of Iran and obviously the Chinese ob- obfuscation and, and in Australia and New Zealand, the antipodes, the almost complete um, suppression or squashing of the curve, as they say. Yes, there have been different policy reactions, different public reactions, different epidemiologies. I mean, the infection and mortality rates seem to have varied sharply and in part because of public policies, in part for factors or for reasons that we don't seem to really have a clear or firm handle on just yet. So all of that's very interesting. And and if one was to draw a general conclusion, it would be this, that in the absence of a global regime of early warning and and um, public health management, in, in the absence of agreed protocols for heading off and handling something like this, each country has reacted according to its local circumstances and culture on an improvised basis. That's precisely what Wolf hoped we would have overcome before now. And had we done so, we would have been much better placed to handle this than we were in fact. Um, and it's worth, I think, putting this in a bit of depth of perspective by remarking that, that very frequently when people talk about politics or economic management, they talk in generalised ideological terms as if everybody is more or less the same or should be and they know what that way should be. They need to keep thinking because it's much more complex than that. And uh, although this will seem a long way from the pandemic context and current politics, this was driven home to me many years ago when, as part of my doctoral studies, I was looking at the history of El Salvador and the brutal violence that took place there in the 1980s. And there was a book um, by a a specialist on Central America. They're a rare breed. (laughs) Uh, Specialists in any field are, by definition, a fairly rare breed. But this was about the little republics that make up the isthmus in Central America. Mm. And the author made a very instructive point. He said, all of these countries have the same basic geography. They grow pretty much the same cash crops, prominently among them coffee. But they all have different political histories. They all have differing levels of inequality, of state violence, of democracy and dictatorship. How can that be if geographic uh, circumstances or economic geography are determinative? Well, because they have different human communities that made different choices, and these have had consequences. All right. Now, without digressing to discuss how we reached that conclusion, it was very illuminating to me, and I think we need to bear that in mind now. So whether you're in Western Europe, where there are differences between countries, or you're comparing Western Europe with East Asia, or either of them with the United States, or Australia with New Zealand, or or Oceania with Europe, and so on. All these different comparisons. What we're encountering is that different political cultures from different starting points with different public habits and attitudes to public policy have, for those very reasons, responded differently. Mm. And and that's not to lay blame, actually, at anybody's door. It's just to be analytical. It's just to understand what's happened and why it's happened. If there were clearer global protocols and greater confidence in early warning systems, that would be modified, Mm. and we're not there yet. Mm. And could you also reflect on the the virus in its politicised or popular imagination? And in particular, I'm referring to the kind of, um, well, proliferation, viral proliferation even of conspiracy theories and sort of, you know, human kind of incomprehension at where this virus has come from in the absence of that deep history you've just outlined. Yes, well, it's important to remind ourselves that, uh, without wanting to sound condescending, most people, for very understandable reasons, don't have an historical context on which to base their judgment. So they don't know about previous diseases. They might be only vaguely aware of them occurring at all. Right? They don't know about virology. They don't do probability and statistics. And so when you talk about exponential uh, infection rates and their implications for mortality, uh, 
uh, as a matter of probability. It's like talking to them about meteorology and weather. You know, they, they don't understand how you make probabilistic estimates. They think this is either going to happen or it's not. But, but weather isn't that way. It's chaotic. And infection rates will vary enormously depending on density, comorbidities, public policy, and as we've seen, self-isolation or quarantine. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, in the absence, therefore, of a sound basis for making judgments and given fear and rumour, people will respond in what we would regard from a sober point of view as irrational ways. The remarkable thing, certainly in the case of Australia and New Zealand, is that overwhelmingly, despite discomfort and concern, people have heeded uh, public policy warnings and government advice. And as a consequence, we appear to have sailed through the worst of this and to have a situation, epidemiologically at least, largely under control. That's good news. The economic consequences, they're another matter. We might come back to that. But why is it in those circumstances, given uncertainty, given ignorance, uh, given fear and concern, uh, that conspiracy theories will spring up? Well, that's what happens under those circumstances. Where there's bewilderment and fear, people will latch on to Mm. fearful and dramatic explanations or pseudo-explanations. This happens chronically in human affairs. And, and, you know, let's take an illustrative example. So in the mid 18th century, there's a major earthquake that destroys a lot of Lisbon in Portugal. And it set a lot of people speculating as to, as to why had this happened. Now, they didn't have a theory of seismology and earthquake incidents and probability at the time. They didn't even have what we would recognise as modern geology. So this is, this is 80 years before Charles Lyell's Principles of Geology, right? And so various theologians weighed in helpfully and say it's God's punishment for the vices of the citizens of Lisbon. It's a very traditional religious view, right? Mm. Um, but, but the philosopher Immanuel Kant, among others, pointed out, well, I'm not sure that theory works because one of the areas of Lisbon that was not destroyed by the earthquake was the red light district, <laughs> right? Now, that's a use of empirical data to upend sloppy thinking, right? And, and the way people jump to conclusions and pseudo-explanations. What's happened in present circumstances is that in a great deal of uncertainty and apprehension uh, to do with how quickly this disease might spread, whether they themselves are in danger, whether the government is concealing stuff, whether the lockdown is going to hurt them financially and so on, which it has a lot of people, uh, people are susceptible to rumours and conspiracy theories. Mm. And there's been some really wild ones out there, and we could talk about a few of those. Yeah, well, let's, let's do it. I mean, who would believe, firstly, who would believe such things, but also what what kind of conspiracy theories have there been about coronavirus? Yeah, well, so the, the answer to the first part of your question is the people who will be inclined to believe these things are those who suffer most from ignorance, uncertainty and fear, right? So those who have a scientific training, a public policy training, uh, an education in the nature of pandemics, etc., are better placed than uh, Joe Citizen to say, okay, I think I get the general idea. I think I understand broadly at least what's happening, what the implications are and what it might make sense to do about it. And they can participate Mm. more or less rationally in the discussion or respond to public policy if they're not a direct participant in the making of it. Uh, But if you're already of a mind that the world is manipulated by secretive elites and, and, and alas, very many people are these days, then you might well be susceptible to the suggestion that, for example, as has been doing the rounds on social media, there is no coronavirus. This is a hoax perpetrated by these global elites because they're imposing on us new social media um, technologies like 5G. Mm. Uh, and when they tell you they're going to vaccinate you, don't go near them. Don't have the vaccination because it's going to be a means to secretly implant in you tracking devices that will make you even more vulnerable to manipulation and control through 5G. This is actually out there. You can listen to videos and uh, and audio recordings where this is being preached. That's a hell of a conspiracy theory, right? And, uh, you know, without spending our precious time discussing why it's mad, uh, let's just pronounce that it is. And yet it has gone viral. And... Mm. I know of people personally who have taken it seriously Mm. and they ask innocently and earnestly, is this true? Mm. Why would they ask me? Because even though they're susceptible to believing such a thing, 
they respect my knowledge and judgment. Um, and so I gently try and explain to them that it isn't true and they need to just calm down a little. <laughs> yeah, but there are some conspiracy theories which are taken up at the highest level of the United States government even or other world, um, sorry, world governments. Um, I sound a consp- conspiracy theorist myself. Uh, no, but other national governments, you know, for instance, that, you know, the, the Chinese plot theory is that this was some sort of form of biological warfare that the Chinese government, which is known to be, um, you know, malicious and, and, and scheming in many ways, um, or, or that it was some, simply accidentally leaked from, a, you know, the Wuhan uh, virology lab, for instance. Um, yes, there, there are um, what you might call a hierarchy of uh, conspiracy theories regarding Chinese Communist Party behaviour in this, and it's worth setting this in clear perspective for two reasons. One is because they are out there, and unlike the 5G or other madcap conspiracy theories, they have at least a general plausibility. So the, the gravest accusation has been that the Wuhan Virology Institute and another um, bio-research institute in Wuhan were actively and deliberately working to create humanly transmissible coronaviruses that could be used to conduct what two senior Chinese colonels in 1997 called unrestricted warfare. In other words, instead of launching uh, biological warfare with uh, unambiguously um, you know, lethal military biological weapons, the plot putatively, was to develop something that would look like it was uh, uh, something like SARS, that had just broken out accidentally, but would in fact be deliberately leaked. And then there'd be a time interval between it being deliberately leaked and any uh, announcement by the party that this was a humanly transmissible disease until it had gone global. Then they would shut it down in China so that they'd limit the damage to themselves and let it wreak havoc in the outside world in order to increase or further their strategic agenda of becoming the master power in the world. That theory has been put out there. All right. Now, why is there any plausibility to it? First of all, because the book Unrestricted Warfare was in fact written in 1997 by two senior colonels at the National Defence University in Beijing. They did argue these kinds of things. Uh, and uh, so... There's, as it were, what you might call that background plausibility. They could do this. They were thinking about doing something like this. Well, it doesn't take very much imagination then to, to apparently put two and two together or connect the dots. Uh, so this is not like 5G. This is not completely off the wall. Um, the question is, of course, as in any such conspiracy, so granted that background suspicion of plausibility, what is the evidence that that in fact is what happened? Well, the first reality check you need to make is, so let's suppose somebody at least, like those colonels, thought, why don't we do this? Why would the party as a whole and the power brokers in China buy into that, given that the consequences would be so grave? So first of all, how could they guarantee that if they deliberately let it loose, they could control it in China? Secondly, if they let it out in the outside world, how could they be confident that the outside world wouldn't cotton on to the fact that they'd deliberately done this and they'd be held to pay? Thirdly, if in order to bring it under control, even in China, you had to shut down the economy, what about the huge cost of doing that? Why would you do that if you want to become the predominant economic power? Why shut down your economy? Hmm. China's economy has shrunk in the last few months. The first time for the first time years. since hmm. 1976, in fact. All oh, right. This is dramatic. So when you do that basic reality check, you think "Mm, it begins to look rather implausible that they would take those huge risks and suffer those immense costs for a putative gain that they couldn't guarantee, all right? Uh, But but that's quite separate from the question of is there any direct evidence that that happened? And the answer to that is no. We don't, at the moment, have any direct evidence that's what happened. What we do know is, to a near certainty, is that disease did originate in Wuhan, This brings us to a second level, uh, as it were, conspiracy theory, which is not that it was deliberately released by the Chinese government for strategic reasons, but that it unintentionally escaped from their experimental labs, got into Wuhan, possibly through the wet market, and they were initially shutting down news about it because they thought, we don't know the truth yet. We don't know whether it came from the lab. We don't know whether some mad subcomponent deliberately leaked it. It wasn't policy, but gee, this is going to look really bad. So this is giving the party, in fact, benefit of doubt. They're trying to bring it under control and figure out what happened before 
um, it sets hairs running. Uh, and then they realize, wow, this is serious. And at that point, they actually come out and say, this is a pandemic. All right. Mm. Um, uh, so there's a lot of ground to be gone over. And, and that is more plausible in all circumstances than the big conspiracy theory. That is that, that they, yes, they conspired to conceal it, but they did it because they themselves weren't certain what was going on. Mm. The third conspiracy theory is that they didn't deliberately leak it. Um, uh, they didn't um, try and exploit it geopolitically once it had leaked. But once it had leaked out of control, they thought, we've got to bring it under control domestically, and now we've got to look good domestically and internationally. So propaganda they conduct a offensive. propaganda campaign. Mm. Now, that is true. That is what they're doing. And so that's not in a pejorative sense of conspiracy theory. That's actually what's happening. And it's causing quite a bit of irritation and pushback, though, because people are saying, God, could you, this is a bit rich. You act irresponsibly so that this thing starts to happen. You, you don't warn us, and so it spreads globally. We're all paying the cost. And now you want to tell us you're the good guys in this? I'm sorry, that doesn't cut in the eyes. Mm. But that's where we're at right now. Yeah. So go back to the biological warfare um, uh, sort of theory. But Greg Sheridan uh, made the point in the Australian newspaper on the 2nd of April that that biological warfare story doesn't stack up to evidence and has been rejected by the Five Eyes intelligence analysis. Uh, analysis. So would you differ him in any? Would you differ with him in any way? Especially given that you've got Senator Tom Cotton from the United States senate uh, basically putting two and two together trying to sort of assert that it, it, in, it was indeed a biological warfare which was either, either leaked deliberately or accidentally and that um try there was some sort of malicious intent behind the virus yes uh i i would say that um basically what greg sheridan was doing uh, and let's bear in mind that greg would be in the eyes of most people a, a right-wing correspondent right so if somebody in, in his newspaper was going to accuse the chinese of getting up to mischief it might be greg right <laughs> but instead he says no we need to hose that down because that, that actually doesn't stack up and and his point of reference is not a personal opinion. It is that the five eyes, which for those who are not aware of this means the five English-speaking countries who since 1947 or basically since the Second World War have had an intelligence alliance around the world, the United States, the UK, Canada, Australia and New Zealand, their intelligence communities which, which have long cooperated globally, which share information, which do our analysis, have agreed among themselves we don't think this is what happened. Now, if anybody was going to blow the whistle on a Chinese conspiracy to launch biological warfare, it would be Five Eyes, and they would be held to pay. I mean, imagine if the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor and then somebody in Washington said, nah, it's not the Japanese. Well, of course, in that case, there was no way to conceal it. It was very obviously, yeah. right? In this case, of course, if it had been covert warfare, if it had been a biologically engineered virus launched to cause mayhem and mischief, that would be an act of war and it would be the job of Five Eyes to pin that down. And then what would happen next? Well, that's not at all clear, which is why I said it's actually implausible the Chinese would have done it in the first place. Hmm. The fact that they looked at this very closely, given their responsibilities and their access to secret information, they drew the conclusion, no, we don't think so, says Greg, ought to reassure us that, that almost certainly that's not what we're seeing. It's hmm. not biological warfare by the Chinese. Um and, and the nature of critical reasoning uh, is that, that as with scientific theories, you, you don't say categorically there's no possibility that it was. What you say is there's a high degree of probability that it's not, right? And if there was any serious degree of probability, the Five Eyes Intelligence Agency would have been saying to the government, we have grave concern that the Chinese have acted completely out of school here. This is a big problem. And then... We've got to decide very quickly what to do about it because they're on the offensive. Publicly and privately as well. Well, they would certainly have been doing that on a, on a confidential basis mm. in briefings to the leaders mm. of these five countries. And it's very difficult to imagine that if there was any serious grounds for believing that, that you wouldn't have had the Western countries, the five most countries and their allies saying, this is an act of war and there's going to be very serious measures as a result. What measures? Well, gee, one even doesn't like to think. Right, because it would have been the the secretive and biological equivalent of Pearl Harbor. It would have been an attack on the outside yeah, world. Yeah. What they're saying is we don't think that happened, and we should draw a deep breath and say, well, probably, therefore, it's not what happened. All right, but here's the thing: 
what Greg didn't do, and he didn't have the space to do in a single newspaper article, is go back and say, however, when you consider the the clear strategic ambitions of the Chinese state under Xi Jinping, which is made very explicit, not guesses or conspiracy theories, when you consider the the proposals laid out in the book Unrestricted Warfare and the statements being made by a number of other leading Chinese strategic thinkers in the years since then, you can see why people might have leapt to the fearful conclusion that this is what happened. There is a serious discussion here. This is not the 5G nonsense. This is a, the nature of the problem we've got in assessing Chinese intentions and actions. And until the Chinese state becomes more transparent and cooperative in international affairs, that problem is not going to go away. Yeah. And regardless of whether it was a Pearl Harbor incident or not, there has been a massive recalibration already amongst Five Eyes uh, partners. Um, the most um, sort of, uh, I suppose, high profile one would be the reconsideration of Huawei being allowed um, to sort of run that 5G network in the UK. That sort of partnership is being reconsidered. And there there have been talks at Number 10 in Downing Street in the UK about a massive um, sort of reckoning with China has been the language. So, you know, regardless of whether it was purposeful or not, I think that the relationship with China is going to be reset going forward. Yes, it was very striking, as you say, that, that the UK in particular, um, uh, the Johnson government said, OK, we are going to reset the relationship with China. In fact, there's going to be a serious reckoning once we've got past this immediate mm-hmm. crisis. That is because for some considerable time now, and this has been true in Australia as well as elsewhere in the Western world, there's been growing exasperation with the Communist Party. And without digressing to go into chapter and verse on this, for the better part of 30 years, the policy consensus in the Western world was if we invest in China, if we open up to China, if we allow it to sell it its manufacturers, China will prosper. That'll be good for us. We can profit from trading with China. And as it becomes more prosperous, its middle class will grow. They'll want political liberalisation and the Communist Party will become a more tractable regime and open up and everybody will be happy. A rising tide will lift everybody's boats. It hasn't happened. And so there's been a sea change in much of the West in probably the last five years. Mm. Uh, And that's certainly true in Australia on a bipartisan basis, really, despite the fact that we have indeed benefited greatly from China's growth. We've profited handsomely. We've run a, a big trade surplus with China. But the consensus is China is not well-intentioned. It's not benign. It's it's intending to take over, and we don't want it to take over. Hmm. Uh, and it's not liberalising. In fact, it's becoming a harsher dictatorship, and that's a serious concern. So what are we going to do about it? So Boris Johnson's shift about five years is a small part of that bigger picture, and the pandemic has precipitated it. So one of the things we're going to be looking at as we emerge from this crisis is the way the outside world... Uh, responds now to an unrepentant, mendacious and manipulative China. Yeah. So how does this all play out globally then? Well, that's, as it were, the uh, the $64,000 question. And in fact, to update it in the light of the expenditures that have been going, you might call it a $64 trillion question. <laughs> <laughs> because the, the costs to countries around the world of just coping with this pandemic have been enormous. And... Uh, the irritation with China for behaving uh, in an irresponsible and opaque manner about it is running deep. Uh, So the most constructive and enlightened approach would be for the Western democracies, first of all, to confer with one another, secondly, to rally to their side as many aggrieved countries in the developing world, notably in Africa, where there's much discontent with the way China's behaved, uh, in a coalition to say to the Chinese, OK, so here's the way it has to play. You don't get to dominate. You must cooperate. We welcome you and we have been welcoming you for 30 years to trade with us, to become a senior partner in global security. And we have been hoping that because we we invited you into the World Trade Organization, we invested, we opened our markets to you, that you would play cricket. But instead, you're playing hardball. That must change yeah. because this cannot work can't work for us. And because it can't work for us, you're going to realise it cannot work for you. You need to rethink your strategy. And we know you're capable of doing that because Deng Xiaoping underwent a sea change in his outlook on basic things after Mao died. 
and China began to open up. And then you got cold feet about that and you killed thousands of people in 1989 to crush the aspirations for democracy in your country. That's got to change. Yeah. And we know that there are powerful interests in your country that don't want to go that way. We're here to tell you there's no other choice. If you want to be a responsible and welcome participant in global affairs, instead of trying to seek to be masters of the universe, you must change. And the best way to do that is peacefully and intelligently and gradually, the way we've been hoping for 30 years that you would. Mm. But now's the time, you know. Mm. Uh, now, will that occur? Will there be that cohesiveness in the outside world's response? That's anybody's guess because Donald Trump is supposed to be the leader of the free world and he's not going there. He's all over the map on this. And and uh, there isn't a clear consensus. There's a there's a common irritation, but it's a long way yet from being a clear strategic consensus about what to do. Yeah. And and China is dug in to its to its foxhole at the moment. It's it's by no means evident that Xi Jinping and the party are thinking, gee, this was a screw up. We'd better talk to the outside world about how to manage better. They're not thinking that way at all. They're thinking about exploiting this for all it's worth. And when those cascading social and economic impacts, which are as severe as they've been since the Great Depression, um, are fully sort of realised over the next 12 months, combined with the kind of the trend over the last five years towards sort of rising domestic populism and, uh, and nationalism, it paints a pretty bleak picture, I think, not just between you know, China and the rest of the world, but also within different sort of geopolitical areas like Oceanic region or... Um, in Europe, you know, much more sort of long-running tensions could sort of boil over. Yes, they could. And uh, uh, one doesn't want to overplay um, analogies, but many people have been soberly reflecting, it seems to me. I mean, strategic thinkers, not not necessarily members of the public, but uh, reflecting on the precedent that haunts us all who know any history, and that is of the Great Depression and what then happened in the 1930s. Because the global depression introduced a degree of, of uh, wildness and unpredictability and reactionary politics around the world. Uh, most famously, it precipitated the rise to power of the Nazis in Germany. It precipitated the takeover in Japan of the military from a parliamentary government. It precipitated in, for example, we referred to Central America earlier in El Salvador. You went from a, 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 a basically a nascent democracy, a constitutional government, to a military dictatorship. Uh, you had a peasant uprising and thousands of peasants were massacred by the army to restore conservative rule. That was happening all over the world. Uh, fascist Italy, you know, rose and it invaded uh, Libya and Ethiopia. So the fear is that instead of the liberal international order, which uh, despite the reaction against it by many populist groups in the Western world in recent years, uh, did in fact make possible uh, the greatest expansion in average human well-being across the planet, the greatest growth in wealth, including China's growth in wealth, uh, over the last 30, 40, 50 to 70 years, ever in history. Uh, and that should not be underestimated. That was the Pax Americana. That was the American-created order based on Bretton Woods. And without the role America played, it would not have happened. Uh, and it's now all in danger. And to the extent that countries now start to do what China clearly is doing, which is to say our interests are paramount, bugger everybody else, then we're back in the 1930s. Mm. And the results will be uh, predictably the rise of more nationalist, xenophobic uh, governments, uh, a recrudescence in at least some places of militarism and as a reaction to that defensiveness in certain other countries. I'm not suggesting we're going to have World War III because the nuclear arsenals of major states still are overwhelmingly likely to inhibit major war. But unhappy and uh, non-constructive things are distinctly possible. Mm. And so the great challenge before us all is to think as clearly and calmly as we can and advocate for intelligent policies and try to build coalitions rather than build armed camps. Yeah. And when you think about that, as a sort of prognostication, uh, coupled with existing global problems such as you know climate change or environmental destruction, uh, global hunger, um, and the eradication of major development gains across the developing world, um, are there any silver linings behind these rather dark and ominous clouds? Well, 
It seems to me that there are, provided we we work with that metaphor um, advisedly. So when one talks about silver lines behind dark clouds, it's not just saying there aren't dark clouds. That's the whole point of a silver line behind dark clouds. So the dark clouds are indeed the things which, to which you've just referred, right? That the things could, pull, could fall apart rather severely here in a number of ways. And this pandemic has, as you rightly said, occurred in a context where there were already a number of serious global concerns that weren't being handled optimally, to say the least. So what's the silver lining, if there is one? Well, it seems to me that more immediately and driven home more personally to masses of people around the world than the climate change thing ever really has been, what the pandemic has highlighted is we need global solutions. And those solutions have to be based on accountability, transparency and cooperation. They can't be based on fierce opportunistic interstate competition because that's precisely what generated this problem. And uh, and therefore, we have to think more clearly than ever about what form international conventions and cooperations can take such that we can head off or overcome challenges of this generic nature, not just pandemics, but other global problems that transcend national borders. Mm. And I think that is a silver lining because it, it is something that people have been very focused on. And during a lockdown, because of uh, of enforced sort of time off, stand out time, I think there's growing evidence. A lot of people have been thinking, you know, I'm living differently now than I was before. I'm spending more time with my family. I'm using social media to communicate with people where perhaps I didn't before because I was too busy or I met them at work or in the street anyway. I'm thinking about, gee, disease. I'm thinking about how do I run my household budget. I'm thinking about priorities in life. I'm thinking about life and death. This is all actually quite healthy. These are actually good things to be thinking about. Mm. Uh, and the, the big one, is the question of global governance. We are in this together. And so I referred earlier, I think, to the scenario in the popular film, The Martian, where it's a feel-good movie and you have Matt Damon marooned on Mars. And what happens? Not only does he think very clear-headedly and scientifically about how to survive, and he does it successfully, but his colleagues who are in the spacecraft heading back to Earth, when they realise that he's actually alive, not dead, they think, we've got to go back, he's our mate. We're not going to abandon him. The people back on Earth debate, okay, so what can we do? How can we do it? What should we do? And this is such a big problem. It's a human problem, really. It's a species problem. Let's, for heaven's sake, reach out to the Chinese. They're getting very technologically advanced. Maybe they can help. You know, as I say, this is a feel-good Hollywood movie. Mm. It's, But it's, it, it's beautiful precisely because it's not cynical or purely realistic. And it's saying to us, suppose we behave this way. Suppose we were scientific, team-based, cooperative and internationalist. Wouldn't we get better results? Mm. That's the silver lining. On that note, Paul, thank you very much for your time this evening. It's been a pleasure as always. That's great, Nick. It's good to have these conversations.